up, so uh, we're now going to go to our plenary talk to the speaker we invited by the... Yeah, and she originally did a PhD in Brown with Chi Wang Shu and then... Yes, and I was also at Oak Ridge. <laughs> Um, so thank you first for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and I'm learning many new things because uh, my area is basically um, extracting uh, the hidden information out of approximations and I work with other people to make this usable and that's what I'm going to talk about. But first I'm going to note a few differences. Since I want to make the lecture a bit easy, I'm going to be doing scalar hyperbolic equations. So equations of the form uh, ut plus f of ux is zero. Of course, if, when I refer to uh, linear equations, f of u is some constant times u, or for nonlinear equations, we have Berger's equation, f of u is u squared over 2, which is just um, a parabolic uh, nonlinearity, or e to u, the u for a strong nonlinearity. So, just wanted to note that because I'll forget it later. Um, and as I said, I'm going to be talking about exploiting the hidden properties of this method. So, um, one thing is that I'm talking about discontinuous Galerkin methods, but these apply to all Galerkin methods, and this is very much related to Jan's talk, so it's very good that this talk was before you. He presented a bit more maths than I am going to present, but I want to look at it from a DG context, and we can put it in the general Galerkin context. And the general DG context is that we have our... Um, our approximation space and our test space is uh, basis functions of piecewise polynomials that are defined element-wise. And if we look at the global approximation, we have our modes times our basis functions. And well, I'm going to talk about what happens after we solve a DG solution. I want to note a few things of some other work I've been doing, and that's that um, DG can be related to a multi-wavelet basis. So if this is our DG elements, there is a natural extension between the basis functions and the multi-wavelet basis. So that we ha if we're using the Legendre polynomials for our DG basis, we can use our orthogonal decompositions on coarser meshes. And this leads naturally, this is work with Taya Falk at Delft, this leads naturally to troubled cell indication, or in the case of these guys from Aachen, um, adaptivity methods. And that's one th way to look at the hidden properties. All you're doing in this is just writing the approximation in another way. That's it. But if we write the approximation in, in another way, we can also look at it at the final time. And when we do that, um, DG ex um, exerts this well-known superconvergence property, and Galerkin methods do as well. And this was proven long ago by Ajir, Divine, Flaherty, and Krivodanova. So this is kind of what we expect. These are the discretization errors for DG. We have quadratic for k equals 1, and for k equals 2, you can see a cubic mesh. Of course, you have to plot many points per cell to see whether your solution has superconvergence. And then you'll see this end a coarse mesh. So these are eight elements. So then you'll, you can see, OK, let's look at this. And you see that it crosses the zero axis at specific points within an element. And what we can do when we take that superconvergence is this is the discretization errors in DG plotted six points per cell so that we can see the oscillatory nature of the errors for a very simple linear hyperbolic equation. Now, somebody else computes the DG solution for me, like one of you guys, and then you pass me the information on the nodes or the nodal basis, whichever you want, because as Robert said earlier, we can easily swap from one basis to the other, and then we can post-process. And when we post-process, the DG solution only has weak continuity. 
The post-process solution, we evolve it, uh, we can evolve it with um, beast lines of order, well, degree k. So essentially, this winds up being a polynomial of degree 2k plus 1. And depending on the equation, if you're doing hyperbolic, you only get 2k plus 1. But if you're doing parabolic or elliptic, you get 2k plus 2, order accuracy here. But you see you also get smoothness. So um, I'm infamous for making my talks at the last minute, and I didn't do that. And after I talk to people here, I hear a lot of things that are interesting. And one of the things are applications. What is this good for? Why should we care about superconvergence when it's going to cost us extra? Well, the information's there. You might as well use it. And also, maybe it's good for higher order visualization. Maybe not. But um, this is um, work on applications and visualization is done with the other Robert Kirby, the Mike Kirby at Utah. And I'm not going to talk too much about it, but if you uh, would like to know about it, I can give you some information. So, um, yes, so these are my collaborators. As I said, Mike works more on the computational aspects. Shang Meng is a, a postdoc here with me at UEA, and these are some of my students, and as Colin said, I moved from Delft, so this guy's finishing in one week. <laughs> and then I have two students at UEA, and I have to give thanks to the Air Force and the ERC. Okay, so, as I said, the discontinuous Galerkin method is a consists of a piecewise polynomial approximation space of degree less than or equal to k. This is one of the nice components. But when we look at the discretization errors, this is also why we see highly oscillatory errors. Secondly, I said that the methods I'm introducing today are not just good for DG. You can use them in general for finite element methods. And indeed, they were originally developed for parabolic fi finite element methods. Um, so what gives this this nice property that makes it work so nice is the variational formulation. And with DG, you also have this weak continuity uh, imposed for the, for the inter-element fluxes. But then, as I said, you have this property of superconvergence. And that just means that usually we expect a convergence rate of, degree, of order R, but maybe we get something r plus sigma, where sigma is greater than zero. And maybe that occurs just at specific points, like it did in the first case. Or we can create superconvergent solutions through post-processing the approximation. And this is one of the things that um, is direct from Jan's talk. You can extend that to creating superconvergent solutions. So you could do adaptivity using a superconvergent solution construction. And for DG, the error estimates using the upwind flux, um, you get order k plus 1, order accuracy, for the NL2. But as I said, we have this um, superconvergence error estimate here uh, of h to the 2k plus 2. And I keep telling you it's 2k plus 1 for hyperbolic equations. And notice there's no time derivative here. This is just a general ODE. You add in time, and this reduces by one order. And furthermore, this is where Jan's talk fits in, is because the thing is that we can bound the, this special negative order norm. It's the difference between the exact solution and the approximation. And it, this is how it's defined. It's just defined as a semi-norm uh, over your usually subloaf norm. We can bound this by h to the 2k plus 1, provided your solution has enough regularity, of course. If your solution doesn't have enough regularity, we could bound it by something higher than k plus 1. But this bound, we not only need this for the solution itself, we need it for the divided differences. So DG has this nice property that the divided differences of the error, so if we create a divided difference solution in DG, which nobody looks at, it's of the same order as the errors themselves. Okay, so this is a very, it turns out to be very important when you're talking about. Is this a multi-result or a multi-result? It's a multi, well, yes, this is a multi-D result for DG if you're talking about linear equations. For nonlinear equations, it will decrease, it, 
it's a special estimate. So, yes, it's a very touchy thing. So, um, for linear equations, everything's easy and nonlinear. You can do systems, no problem. When you're talking about nonlinearities, this is where the problems arise. Because you have problems stemming from the flux itself, and sometimes you have problems stemming from the mesh. And also, the, and then from the flux, and then the divided differences of the flux. And there's two ways this flux for nonlinear equations factors in. <laughs> so first, <laughs> so first, in order to ensure this estimate is valid, you have to define an inverse problem. You don't actually have to compute the inverse problem, but theoretically you have to consider the inverse problem. So you have to have the divided differences of the flux giving you higher order accuracy, which I will talk about later for nonlinear problems. But then you have to divide the, <coughs> define the proper inverse problem for nonlinear equations. Well, that's non, not unique, so you have a problem there. Okay, so what I want to talk to you about is how to extract information. And I'm going to talk about it in ter general terms. As I said, somebody here gives me the DG approximation at the final time. And then I can c convolve it with this kernel. And this kernel has R plus 1 B splines. These are my B splines. So in the case, <clears throat> these are R plus 1 B splines, and the B splines are order L. So in the case where L is 2, I have the linear B splines that Jan was talking about. And so what I'm doing is I'm, post I'm here in this element, and I want to find a higher order solution in this element using my DG approximation. I'm going to look around at my neighbor neighbors. If I'm in the, far away from the domain boundary, I'm going to take a symmetric amount of information from both sides. Of course, these B splines have to be suitably scaled by the mesh. If you have a structured mesh or a translation invariant mesh, um, it's fine. Everything extends. If you have a non-uniform mesh, we have to be careful. And so, of course, as we go near a boundary, we have to move our support. And one of the things is that usually, and this is what we first did, when you go near a boundary, you say, okay, I need more information from my interior in order to get a higher order solution here. That is fine if you're on a uniform mesh or a structured mesh. If you are not, it's not fine. You have to think about compacting your support more. So this kernel does have compact support. So this is the K is 2 case. I'm taking five B splines of order 3. So these are quadratic polynomials. And then the kernel, these coefficients here multiplying the B splines do satisfy the partition of unity. And they're obtained by um, reproducing polynomials of up to order um, R. Okay, so this is the kernel. And this, we call it the SIAC filter. So we can filter near a boundary. For derivative filter, you can filter your derivatives. So this allows up to 2k plus 1 order accuracy if your DG um, polynomial is order k plus 1. Your derivative filter is the same. So I can compute a linear approximation and ob obtain a third order accurate fourth derivative with this filter. And that's really nice. Of course, the problem is your support will grow. OK, so for implementation purposes, first we compute the kernel coefficients. And as I said, we're just reproducing polynomials. So we form this matrix vector system where the elements of the matrix are given by this. These are our polynomial, our, our SIAC coefficients. Oops. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, so these are our coefficients that are here. 
we just form a, a vector here, and then these are the polynomials we're reproducing. However, the condition number, of course, we have the age-old problem, the condition number of the matrix can become very large, in which case we want to choose, change the polynomials that we use. Uh, yeah, so a few important notes. If you're in the domain of interior, the coefficients are the same for the entire domain interior as long as you can use the symmetric kernel. When you're near the boundary, the coefficients will depend on the distance you are from the boundary. And as I said, we can optimize the condition number. Now for the rest of the post-processor, once we compute that, once we compute that, we need to compute this convolution. So it's just matrix vector multiplications, but notice we're taking our neighbors. So these are the modes on element i plus j, so j goes from minus p prime to p prime in the symmetric case. So these are the modes multiplied by some post-processing coefficient matrix, which is the convolution of the baseline kernel against the DG basis functions. So these are the DG basis functions. The, as I said, this is a polynomial degree 2k plus 1. But you can only see 2k plus 2 for non- Oh, I shouldn't say it this way. I should say it for elliptic or parabolic. I was going to say non-linear non hyperbolic equations, but elliptic or parabolic equations, okay? And the non-symmetric case is similar. So you, you really only have to compute this matrix once. It's fine. So in the, case, uh, in the linear case, you are using a hat function. This is an example of our DG basis. This is our element where we want to find a higher order solution in. And um, our coefficients, you see, uh, form the partition of unity, and these are the uh, basis functions. So we'd have this basis function, one over here and one over here. And the 2D kernel is just a tensor product. And um, Mike has a postdoc right now that's working on a hex mesh um, that seems to also work quite well. Now, I, I want to say something about the relation to spe spectral methods. So this is the SIAC kernel in, in, um, in the Fourier space. And you notice that it's the sink function here, right? It's the sink function to some power, the power of the B spline. And then you have this sum, which winds up being around 1 plus order h to the 2k plus 1. And these are what the, the co kernels look like. And this is very much what you see um, when you're looking at spectral filters, a la Van de Ven. Oh, and I should also mention that there's also a link to quasi-interpolation. So you can do some imaging with this, although the edges are not sharp. So the kernel is basically designed to um, extract higher order accuracy. So you go from a solution of order k plus 1 to a solution of order 2k plus 1. Not only that, but the DG solution itself is only weakly continuous at element interfaces. But the post-process solution has smoothness of L minus 2. So in the case for, for linear polynomials, you now have a continuity. You now have continuity which is why this is um, good for visualization in DG, because you have this piecewise polynomial basis. Sometimes your, post your, your visualization tool has a difficult time telling the difference between when there's a real discontinuity or, or just something in the basis functions. And it's a fairly local stencil of R plus L elements. And I should say that my um, student in Delft, who's finishing, is working on making this even more compact because compact is good, right? We want to make sure it's efficient. And of course, this, remember, R plus 1 are the number of these spines. L is the order of the B spine. And K plus 1 is the order of the DG scheme. So this is our order of convergence. It's the minimum of these three, of these three numbers in both L2 and L infinity. And as I said before, we can obtain the same order of accuracy for the derivatives as well, which is really nice. OK, so what is this error estimate? Why does it work? Well, when we look at this, we're looking at the difference between the exact solution and the filtered approximation. 
So of course, first we want to do the triangle inequality and look at the difference between the exact solution and um, the filtered exact solution. And then we look at this. This term can be bounded by, this term is the filtering of the approximation. This term is entirely determined by reproducing polynomials. So if we take two beast lines, we, we can only have second order convergence. Here, so maybe we set this very high, maybe we set it low. It depends on what size of kernel we want. But here, this depends on the divided difference quotients of the DG solution, and also this inverse problem that I was talking about, which is where the negative order norm comes in. So these are the divided differences. And here, what I'm saying, what I'm, I have maybe one, one scaling for the DG mesh, and another scaling, this big H, for the kernel. If they're the same, I actually get 2K plus 1, so this error estimate isn't very good. So I can if I do alpha equals 0, everything's equal to 2K plus 1. But this is a worst case scenario if I have a non-uniform mesh. So um, one of the things I want to talk about when I talk about the divided difference, I'm going to try and talk a little bit on non-linear equations and non-uniform meshes and I think, oh, in the flux, and how the flux affects these approximations. And some interesting properties we've noticed with DG. So let's talk about the choice of the flux and how it affects superconvergence. So the choice of the flux, remember the flux is here. We do an integration by parts on that term, and then we're, what the flux I'm talking about is the inter-element flux, how we define that flux. And so it's very interesting to look some, at some of the different results on superconvergence. So for example, um, Jenshin Chu uh, was originally working on this um, Lax-Windruff discontinuous Galerkin method, and he implemented it one way. And then he tried to apply my post-processor to it, and it didn't work. And that's because he didn't have a, choice, a proper choice of the flux. He needed to define the ideas using a local discontinuous Galerkin scheme. So this local discontinuous Galerkin scheme is for higher order polynomials. And um, once he did that, he had a scheme that worked faster than the original lax windruff dg scheme and had superconvergence and you could extract um, more accuracy out of it. Of course, along the same lines where uh, you can use a semi-Lagrangian DG, and this is work with David Seal, and there's no special treatment to obtain superconvergence. It's just there. Um, and that's because of the projection onto our piecewise polynomial basis along with, with our variational formulation. So, and then recently, we want to look at the difference between using a combination of upwind and downwind flux. And when we do this combination, of course, uh, oh, this should be a plus. <laughs> yes, this should be a plus. And when we use this, we're adding diffusion to our equations. And you say, well, all the proofs are for the upwind flux. Why do we need that? And what we found is that um, depending on whether you use even or odd polynomials, using this flux can be advantageous. And so uh, my student, Daniel Frayn, has extended this to, um, to the superconvergence properties. But first, one of the things I think you might be interested in, if I can get to that slide. Uh, Skip the slide. Okay, you have to be patient. I have to point out a few features because these plots are a bit off. These are the convergence results using the RKDG scheme and the semi-Lagrangian DG scheme. So this is DG in space and Rangakara in time. When you're doing this, this method of lines, of course you have to take the CFL number so that the spatial errors dominate. Here, you don't have to do anything special. So it doesn't matter what polynomial order, we ran it at a CFL of 0 0.88. Um, so here, the dashed lines are the DG error convergence plots, and here, the dashed lines are the post-processed convergence rates. And what you see, 
this is why what makes it so interesting is that you see that both the post-process K is one DG solution and the unpost-process DG solution have the same convergence rate. But you see that your post-process solution is not as good as using the higher order polynomial in that case. However, if you go and you look at the SLDG scheme, this blue dashed line is the K is one filtered solution, and the red solid line is the K is two D, is SLDG solution. And you see that it is almost as good in terms of errors, and that they do have the same convergence rate. So how you're doing your time stepping, or how you're combining your time, does matter when you're talking about post-processing. But, um, and so what we're, why we're looking at the flux is we want to combine this into our time-stepping schemes, right? So when we, we look at our flux and we change our flux so that it's a linear combination of the upwind and downwind points, the original superconvergence just had it at superconvergence at this point, which is the um, left Rideau polynomial, which is the difference between two uh, uh, Legendre polynomials. And this is adding two consecutive Legendre polynomials. So you have a linear combination of this. And where you see an even odd disparity is this term. So if k is odd, then this is minus. If k is even, um, then this is plus. So what happens is when k is even, all the roots still lie within one interval. All the roots of your superconvergent error still lie within one interval. When k is odd, you have one root lying outside your interval. So in order to get um, superconvergence, you ha and even to implement the scheme, you need to define a global initial projection. But what I'm going to say is when you have an odd degree polynomial, it's actually better to do the upwind scheme. When you have an even degree polynomial, I think it's, it's better to implement this uh, upwind bias flux. So that's with the superconvergence. You still get 2k plus 1 order accuracy or at these roots of these polynomials for even degree polynomials and for odd degree polynomials provided this global initial projection is made. And when you want to um, and when you want to post-process the results, the only thing that changes is the constant in the error estimate. But remember, the constant makes the difference between this line and this line. So, so it, error estimators are really getting to where we definitely need to explore more of the constant and improving these constants. And so this is just the difference between using a flux of, of 0 0.55. So remember, 0 0.5 is unstable. And 0 0.85 for K is 2. And, and you just see that the, here it's a bit wider apart than here. And this is for K is 2. And it's on this linear equation. But when we look at... Um, Again, these are the DG errors and the post-processed errors. And on the top is our usual upwind scheme. And on the bottom is using 0 0.55, again, for K is 2. And what you see is the DG scheme. You don't, your oscillations are not as great in your error. So, so that's a, a little bit different. And yeah, so, the, so perhaps these errors are just a tiny bit better. But also, these are really unaffected, your post-process results. And uh, so this is theta 1, theta is 0 0.85, and theta is 0 0.55, um, and L2 and L infinity errors. Uh, for K is 2, you get third order accuracy in all of these. And what you see <clears throat> is that um, the error is just decreasing a bit in all of these tables, for k is 2. If you see k is 3, what happens as you decrease theta is that these errors will increase. You'll still get the correct order, but the errors will decrease. Whereas, and whereas um, you get a stable order with the post-process solution, and um, 
yeah, you get the errors also improve because you have a better solution. However, something that might be more interesting are the nonlinear equations and non-uniform mesh. So for the nonlinear equations, remember what I said, the problem is the divided difference estimates. First, you have to define an inverse problem. That inverse problem is not unique. Secondly, you have to have a divided difference of this. And for a multidimensional, we can have this, uh, this as our divided difference estimate. Remember, for DG, we had k plus 1. And this has to be true for all alpha less than or equal to k plus 1. So if alpha is equal to k plus 1, you don't really have much superconvergence for low-order polynomials. So you might as well not <clears throat> use a very wide kernel, right? So with that, I have to show you, I want to show you the bad results, actually. I'm going to show you the strong nonlinearity instead of the weak nonlinearity. So this is our DG error. This is the traditional kernel with 2k plus 1 b splines, so that would be 5 b splines in this case. But our theory says, really, k plus 2 is what we should be using. So we should be using not as wide of stencil. And this is before the shock happens. And I'll talk about a little what happens after the shock in a minute. But what you see is that the, the full kernel that's good for the linear case is also good for this case. And this also smooths the solution, but the improvement is not clear, right? It's like, did it really have any effect? But certainly here, as long as your mesh is well resolved, it has an effect. Now, I said this is before the shock occurs. Now, if you post-process after the shock occurs, just like in spectral methods, away from the discontinuity, you can recover the 2K plus 1. Near the discontinuity, actually, I invite all of you to apply it, as, try and apply it as a limiter. I've done it. It reduces the oscillations. Not nearly enough, but it does reduce the oscillations. Um, and that's work. That's an, open, that's an open problem. But, okay, so we have our DG errors for P2 and P3. We get our third and fourth order conversions. For our full kernel using 2K plus 1 B splines, we have our proper order accuracy. And using just K plus 2 B splines, so this is the difference using um, 5 B splines versus um, 3, or, yeah, well, 4 B splines, so 1 B spline less. Um, you see that this error here, the order of convergence reduces, and also the errors are not as good as here for P3. And also you see that you have to resolve your mesh a bit better. You have to have a better resolved solution to use the more compact kernel. However, we still have the mesh scaling to play with. So this is something we're working on right now. Um, so we can do it for nonlinear equations, and we're working on the exact scaling we should use. Because right now we're assuming a translation invariant mesh, and the divided differences has to go with the scaling of the translation invariance of the mesh. Okay, lastly, I'm going to talk about non-uniform meshes. And this it might be... Uh, uh, a bit interesting because we're talking about the scaling here. And we have done on unstructured meshes. We have applied it on a lot of unstructured meshes and, and we've noticed a few phenomena that I want to talk about. So here is um, P3, um, the top row and P4 polynomial approximations. The DG is on the left and the kernel using two different types of scaling. So this is exactly, well, basically equal to the largest element size, and this is equal to 1.5, the largest element size, that row. And what you see is if you use the largest element size here, you have error reduction, but you still have a few oscillations. And you ha have the same thing here. Here, you have a little bit of error reduction, but the errors are smooth. And although I present this nice triangulation with element splitting, 
we have done other um, unstructured meshes. And what you see, so we were just saying, okay, let's just implement the post-processor as is, see how it works, do we have anything? Well, um, here we have our clean convergence rate, and the reason we study the element splitting is because if we're going to see anything, we're going to see it with this example. But when we look, we say, okay, what is the convergence rate? Certainly, maybe there's error reduction. Yeah, okay. But what is the convergence rate? And then we look at the convergence plots. And what you see for P2, okay, it looks pretty straight, you can't really see much. And we've looked at many, many of these plots, and most of them came out like the plot for P3 polynomials. What we have is we have this type of scaling that as we decrease, we have error reduction. And then we hit a sweet spot where we have error reduction, and then the convergence rate changes, and the errors get worse again. So we have these error reduction going down and then errors in increasing. And this is for every unstructured mesh we tried. So obviously, so in, if you notice, these spots do not occur in the same place. Depending on the number of elements, depending on the polynomial order of your approximation, um, and depending on how unstructured your mesh is. So we said, okay, we need to go back to the drawing board and look at the non-uniform meshes. And so here, we're going back to look at a 1D problem. And we look at uh, these meshes. So this is a uniform mesh, the top one. The bottom one, the nodes are slightly perturbed. The elements are slightly perturbed. So it's almost quasi-uniform. This is a bit structured, so yeah, it, you can define it through some continuous function in this. It, we just used a random function to create. And so here I give two random functions. This is, mesh two is more random than the mesh one. And I wanted to illustrate that we do see these plots in all cases. And the original theory for this post-processor says that the perfect scaling is here, where we're in the regime where we're just doing error reduction. But the convergence rate changes on this side. This side has a different convergence rate than this, usually. But you see, you, go, you have error re reduction, and then the errors get worse. And that's, this scaling is greater than this scaling for mesh one. And mesh one is, is closer to a structured mesh, a quasi-uniform mesh. Mesh two, however, you definitely see more of a difference because it is more unstructured. So we need something that takes advantage of the structuredness of the mesh. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our unstructured mesh, X, and compare it to a quasi-structured mesh. So this function, this Cassi, is a structured mesh. And this function, you, so you have a function of a structured mesh. And what happens, because it's the divided difference error estimate we care about, is this what kind of error estimate we obtain? So, so that requires us to compute this sigma here. And what we're going to, and we have this sigma into, um, so we're, we're going to have the, D, the DG mesh size, which is the small h, the kernel scaling, which is the large h, but we need to take the DG mesh size to some log of sigma. Of course, um, if we assume, so to compute the structured mesh, one of the questions is, okay, does it really add any cost onto it? And it doesn't. So you can see here, it's 10 to the minus 4 in terms of um, computational cost to compute this sigma via the least squares algorithm. Um, and what happens is that now we have the error estimate for the exact solution minus the filtered solution using 2k plus 1 b spines and k plus 1 b spines of degree k plus 1. We have h to the mu 2k plus 2, where this mu is here. And this is the scaling you're using. The suggested scaling 
had, almost, had the first part, but not the second part. So it didn't take into account the mesh. And when you take into account the mesh, the middle row, original post-process su suggested scaling. This is the DG mesh over, this is our almost um, quasi-uniform mesh. This is our non-uniform mesh. This is our new scaling. And what you see is, yeah, we might have a few oscillations, but we're at, what, 10 to the minus 8, on, where our oscillations are occurring, and that's on our very fine mesh. So here we have error reduction and smoothness. This gives us more smoothness, but you see the errors are increasing. So um, yes, and, and then if you look at the errors, you can definitely see what's going on. We have an order improvement here. It's not so certain. But in our new scaling, you can see order improvement over the first mesh, especially not so much over the unstructured mesh. Not completely surprising. And I shouldn't say unstructured mesh because it's not the fully unstructured, but it's a non-uniform mesh. But you have error reduction and you have improved order of accuracy. The improved order of accuracy, remember, we couldn't tell anything before. Now we have something more stable. Okay, so there are many open problems with this. We can use it for adaptivity, uh, such as in Jan's talk. We can use it for um, improving the accuracy of solutions. We can use it in visualization applications. And there are many, many more applications. And basically, we're improving the solution. If it's DG and it's a linear hyperbolic equation, we're improving it from order k plus 1 to order h to the s, where s is the minimum of the number of beast lines, the order of the beast line plus the order of the dg solution, or the order of the negative order norm. So this would be 2k plus 2 for elliptic and parabolic equations. Of course, if you don't have a smooth solution, you might as well reduce the number of beast lines or reduce the order of the beast lines. And it is useful for reducing spurious oscillations. I have applied it to the Berger's equation. So it's useful for reducing spurious oscillations in the air. And when you're talking about limiting, so for example, Berger's equation, I evolve Berger's equation in time. I don't do anything until the final time. And I can whack out most of the, um, the spurious oscillations around the discontinuity. Um, but we, of course, have to be careful about nonlinear and non-uniform mesh case because this degree of nonlinearity is important in not only the divided difference estimates because this nonlinearity factors into the constant, but it also factors into um, the definition of the inverse problem in order to prove things. We also need to take into account how structured our mesh is in order to define a proper scaling. But we can, even applying it in a very naive manner, we can reduce the error, and perhaps we can reduce the order, or improve the order, not reduce the order. And um, then I want to give some useful references and say thank you. Yes, I believe so. Um, for the linear case, things are easy to extend. No, no. And my second question is the following. You introduced the filter and so, uh, what would you do if you done? 
So it will rep so if you have a polynomial solution, so your approximation is giving you negative. It will. It, there's no guarantee that it will then make it positive. Is okay. Yeah. No. So so the. Yeah. This is a conservative thing. It's only applied at at the final time. So. You're not affecting the properties of the DG solution at, or the finite element solution at all. So it's the same. I mean, it, the thing is, the convolution takes the higher degree continuity. So whether you have continuity at the element interface, you're probably going to have a higher degree of con continuity. It takes whatever is the highest degree of continuity. Will that then uh, 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 end up being even higher accuracy? Yes. No, actually, we're just doing it at the end right now. We hope to work it into it. We want to find an effective way that we can bind the post-processor with whatever choice of time integration pr procedure you want okay, to do. I could imagine there's some sort of more regular interpolation for sending the contribution. Right, right. So most of the, um, when you're talking about doing many of these things, it's actually quadratures that are more of a problem than anything else. So.